And good afternoon, everyone. We are live for the first virtual Education Village panel hosted by the excellent folks at MassCan. This, this panel is the first in a series that are going to be hosted through the MassCan Facebook page. And today's topic in particular is going to fa focus on challenges facing small cannabis businesses in the time of the coronavirus or COVID-19 as, as it's otherwise known. However, these panels are also going to continue over the coming weeks and months and uh, cover a wide variety of issues facing patients, uh, industry uh, folks, uh, consumers, patients, uh, uh, lawmakers, regulators, and beyond. So uh, before we begin today, a huge thank you to MassCan, uh, all those involved for helping these panels uh, have a platform and for organizing them. And uh, thank you to all our panelists who are with us today, uh, who will uh, now have a chance to, to go through and introduce. Before we say hi to them one by one, allow me to just say their names so we all uh, know who we're with today. I'm with Andrew Muddy from Beantown Greentown, Peter Bernard from Mass Sense, Ed D'Souza from River Run Gardens, Mike Brace from Deep Roots, and Ellen Brown from Sense Amelia Seminars. So um, to begin, uh, we'll just take you know 30 seconds to a minute uh, if uh, each person could tell us a little bit about uh, themselves and uh, your company and organization, the work you do related to cannabis. We'll start with Mr. Muddy. Oh, you, you are muted, Mr. Muddy, so I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. All right, here we go. Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Andrew. I'm co-owner of Beantown Greentown with one of my best buddies. And uh, we've been working on it for about four years, running through uh, opening up education for people online. We did it through Instagram. We showed up at shops. Uh, we helped people grow. Uh, that for us has turned into an opportunity to have a legal business. We applied for a micro business uh, almost two and a half years ago now. And uh, our application has been in for a year or more, and we're up for a provisional license coming up uh, tomorrow, actually. So everything's looking up for us, and we're excited about that. So very, very exciting that you're up for a license tomorrow. It's great timing that uh, we have you with us today, because I'm sure we'll get more into that. Um, yeah, thank you. Peter, uh, would you like to share? Hi, my name is Peter Bernard. I'm with uh, Mass Sense. We do what we can for cultivation and manufacturing uh, to make sure that that's going well as best we can. And we work with our uh, legislators and regulators to help facilitate that. Wonderful. Um, Mr. D'Souza, if you'd be so kind. Yeah, thanks. My name is Ed D'Souza. I'm a uh, managing partner for River Run Gardens. Uh, we're a small time cultivation uh, company out of Newburyport, Massachusetts. Uh, we currently have a provisional license in the state and are undergoing construction right now in order to get our final license and plant a seed in the ground. Um, something about us is that uh you know we're there to help uh everybody else in the industry uh we're not looking at competing with people we're looking at building a uh, taking advantage of this wonderful set of laws that allow us to come out of the closet and participate in such an industry so you know, uh, part of um, what we do is we're activists as well, and we like to teach. We feel that the best way to get rid of the stigma out there is to educate. Um, that's enough. <laughs> that, that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, Mike Brace. Hey, how's it going? Um, Mike Bray here from uh, Deep Roots Incorporated. We are also a micro business out of uh, Uxbridge, Massachusetts. Um, we are about two and a half years into the journey as well. Um, and it looks like we may be on the agenda next month for the May 7th meeting. Fingers crossed, you know, we'll see what happens with the Corey checks, but, uh, 
um, it's been a uh, it's been a long road, and uh, like Ed, you know, I'm here to support you know people trying to do the same thing that we were doing, and couldn't have gotten to where we are without the support of people like Ed. So, thank you. Wonderful. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Ellen, please. Hi, my name is Ellen Taylor Brown. I'm the founder of Sensimia Seminars. I also go by Farmer Brown. I'm currently the lead cultivator at a hemp farm in Canada. We're cultivating 55 acre, 55 football fields of hemp uh, for Canada Collective Inc. And we are Health Canada approved. And I'm currently for Sensimia Seminars here in New England, waiting on approval for my responsible vendor training. And I was supposed to be on the agenda tomorrow, but um, it has been pushed back and it probably won't be until July. So once that does happen, I'm looking forward to being able to provide accredited education in the state. And in the meantime, I provide education about a myriad of products and I like to hold free classes for veterans. A lot of what we do at Sensimia Seminars is very uh, veteran focused. Oh, that, that's wonderful. And uh, before we jump into some other questions, uh, some folks who maybe are just joining us, learning about the cannabis industry, probably heard some terms uh, that some of our panelists were talking about there that they may not have known. So uh, just to give folks a, a down and dirty introduction in Massachusetts, there are two types of um, cannabis operations, medicinal and adult use. Uh, today we're talking with some applicants who are in the adult use license application process, and they referenced that they were micro businesses. So what I'd like to do uh, before we jump into some other questions is give one of those micro businesses, Andrew, Ed, or Mike, the chance to explain what a micro business is for folks who might not know about that. I'll take that one if you please, like. Please go ahead, Mike. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, the micro business is a license that um, was was added to the regulations as basically a uh, an easier way for local folks into the industry, or that was what the idea was. Um, so rather than having to have multiple licenses to cultivate, manufacture products, transport. Uh, it's all covered under that one license type. And there are some stipulations such as uh, residency requirements and, and otherwise that that um, make it so it, it is for Massachusetts residents. Uh, that's the basic of it. Wonderful. Uh, Peter, I saw it. Did you want to weigh in here? Yeah, Peter. Yeah, because I, I know a little bit something about that because I helped uh, make the first draft of the micro business license. The the concept of the micro business was originally intended so that people who were doing uh, caretaker grows at their homes, it was designed to give them an opportunity to license what they were doing, growing and manufacturing. Uh, we also thought it would be really great if all licenses had a residency requirement, but this one in particular, because it is kind of cool. You get to do everything with this license except a brick and mortar store. When we put in the draft, we honestly thought they were going to throw it away. Um, I wrote a draft with Dick Evans after we had done a couple of roundtables. Ed, I know you're at Muddy, you're at it too, out in, when we did it out here in Eastern Mass. And we took all those notes, me and Dick Evans one day, and, and we wrote it all down and we submitted it. And we were like, oh, they'll throw this one away. And when we saw it survive and morph into what it is now, every time I see you guys going after these licenses, I smile. It makes me feel like I got something done right. Because to see three people here that are going after that license really makes me feel good. It does. Um, Peter, uh, one question about micro businesses because I, I'm so it's so great to have someone who helped to draft the license here with us. One thing I saw that micro businesses actually might be able to do uh, is something called a delivery endorsement, which was uh, actually the only sort of retail sales path in the Commonwealth outside of brick and mortars. Can you explain a little bit about uh, how the micro license in that way is so unique? Well, without the brick and mortar, there's got to be a limitation somewhere. I mean, think about all the things you can do with that license. You have to put some limits on it. Otherwise, it becomes a very coveted license type. Think about it. You can do everything in the industry with that license. So you got to put some limits on it. Uh, 
but that aspect got taken out when delivery got put into question where it sits now and with social equity, uh, uh, excuse me, social consumption. But when we get those two things back on track, micro businesses will have those things too. And they'll essentially have a brick and mortar store by way of their social consumption cafe. There's just no takeout. If you want takeout, sign up here, we'll send it to your house. But there do have to be reasonable limits like that 2,000 pounds a year you can buy. Otherwise, you could take that micro business license and turn it into a huge commercial manufacturing opportunity, which is not what we were thinking about when we made this license type up. Yep. And I, I think the 5,000 square foot of canopy is also part of the micro business restriction. Yeah. Um, and that uh, you mentioned social equity, uh, and I, I, that's very important, the uh, exclusivity provided to social equity and economic empowerment applicants. And it actually gives me a chance because one uh, more uh, intro question I wanted to ask Ellen was, you talked a little bit about responsible vendor training. Um, could you tell us a little bit about why the Massachusetts sort of social equity program through initiatives like responsible vendor training and others is so unique in terms of how other states uh, uh, lack that kind of uh, training that folks like yourself are able to provide? That's a great question. So what having a responsible vendor training program is going to do is it's going to provide cohesion across the state. So that way we know that all of the um, employees at the dispensary and all the dispensary oper operators have the exact same information and that way the exact same information is being provided to the public we want it to be reputable we want it to be concise and we always want to make sure that um everyone is updated and educated and massachusetts is one of the first states to take an on taking like this so it's, it's really great to have a state that's creating the framework and uh, hopefully other states will follow suit wonderful wonderful i i couldn't agree more um, so thank you for those clarifying questions. I just wanted to make sure uh, the terms that we were all using and, and uh, the audience would, would be able to understand. Um, so diving in a little bit here, uh, for those who follow the cannabis in industry in particular in Massachusetts, you'll be acutely aware that there's been a litany of developments over the past few weeks, uh, starting with an emergency order that was issued by Governor Charlie Baker on the 23rd of March, I believe it was, around there, basically closing all non-essential businesses. As part of that order, medical cannabis operators were uh, certified as essential, but recreational cannabis operators or adult use cannabis operators, uh, such as the applicants we have with us today, were not. So um, as a result of that, uh, to the business owners, Peter, Ellen, can you tell us a little bit about how that decision to exclude um, adult use businesses from the essential uh, business pool has impacted not only your businesses now, but your future planning? And do you think Governor Baker should reconsider his decision? Can I jump in on this one? Please, Ed. So um, right now, I'm, I actually, as of this morning, uh, wrote to Sean Collins, who's the director at the uh, Cannabis Control Commission, to ask for clarity. Um, because when the adult use side was deemed not essential, uh, like many other people, we went to our representatives and senators and uh, tried to uh, have Governor Baker change this. Uh, well, through the grapevine, we've heard there a conversation took place with Governor Baker asking about the ancillary side of the adult use market, the cultivation, the manufacturing, the processing, um, that side of things, um, and mentioned that without these um, operations, uh, it's going to basically start the market over again when the uh, essential uh, limits are lifted. Um, according to this source, uh, Governor Baker has no issue with those sides of the operations. So that's why I reached out to uh, Sean Collins to see if this is in fact uh, going to be announced soon. And if so, that is going to save businesses like ours because I mean, when you're in the game as long as you are just to get a provisional license and then you're 
construction's interrupted because of the COVID-19 issue. And then even if you were able to get through construction and you're able to get your final license, if you're not able to plant a seed in the grounds, you might as well uh, pack it up because uh, you can't you can't compete. Um, but I'm sure others have uh, stuff to say on this topic as well. And, and just before we jump into them, I want to also catch folks up because, and I'm sure Peter can tell us a little bit more about this as well. There was an announcement uh, last night uh, in regards to the cease and desist order that was issued by the Cannabis Control Commission for adult use operators. And the nature of that announcement, Peter, was related to allowing some of these adult use uh, uh, ancillary uh, cultivators and such to uh, continue their operations with that product earmark for the medical supply chain. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the long and short of that is, is the adult use industry will be allowed to feed the medical industry. Um, retail, I don't know. Manufacturing, cultivation, yay. Uh, I'm not sure about the details yet on how that is going to be accomplished, but it's going to be. So... Uh, that's definitely a beautiful thing. And a uh, consequence of that decision, the topic of non-vertical medical licenses come into play. It is no longer a question or a mystery whether or not the commission can give itself authority to create those licenses, licenses because they essentially just did that. Precedent. I'm not a lawyer, but they have essentially just done that by saying a cultivator or a manufacturer can feed into the medical system. So we don't have to wait for legislation for non-vertical. Absolutely, and that's a topic I want to definitely dive more into. Uh, but before we jump into that, uh, to Mike or Andrew uh, or Ellen, um, what, uh, uh, like Ed was talking about earlier, uh, how has this decision by Governor Baker uh, affected your short, long-term, or otherwise plans for your business? Well, for my business in particular, I'll, I do a lot of my seminars in person. That's a that's a big part of the way my business is constructed to be in person and have live demos. Uh, so with everything closing, I think for all of us entrepreneurs, especially like myself, where I'm the sole proprietor, we need to get crafty and creative during these times. So um, I've had to cancel all of my classes. Um, I had... Uh, events I was going to speak at in Chicago. So a lot of things have just gotten pulled back. Um, so creating virtual education is going to be really important. Right now I'm trying to um, look at different platforms for creating modules online and classes online in real time. So I'm hoping to have that out and rolling out like the next two weeks. But it's definitely a time where entrepreneurs need to be adaptable. And it's a really, really important time to support small businesses. There are a lot of small businesses that are hurting for one reason or another that might not make it through this. Not necessarily mine, but product-based companies. So if you can support your friends, you know, like and share, I think that's really important. Wonderful. Um, Andrew, uh, Mike? Yeah. It's been, uh, honestly, it's kind of been a blessing in disguise, a little bit bittersweet, but um, just for the position I'm in, I don't, I don't have a... Uh, provisional license so I can't really do much of anything and other than that once that shows up um, we're still waiting on some construction documents so when I say a blessing my construction document people are saying let's do this now whereas a month ago they were like oh, oh we got too much work we can't touch your stuff so now that I'm there I, I, it's almost a blessing for me that I have this month month and a half and well, as soon as they release restrictions on non-essential construction by that time I think I'll be ready to go so um, a little bit bittersweet but still you know it's there's something there no oh, very interesting and Mike I saw you wanted to weigh in as well yeah uh, you know kind of similar to, to Andrew because you know he's getting his provisional tomorrow I mentioned earlier I've, I'm hoping next month so we're in the same position where like I can't dump money into a building that I don't know is going to get licensed yet. I mean, I've been marked complete, but until I have that provisional, I can't dump money into the building. Right. So we're kind of in that same spot and we're hoping that, uh, again, that uh, non-essential construction is lifted by the time we're ready to roll. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing, you know, a blessing in disguise, if you will, 
is uh, that I think this could have been moved moved along a little faster because uh, the commission is considering uh, waiving fingerprint requirements until uh, final licensure, which is huge for us because we have this 10 people that ha that are on our uh, in our company already that several of them are immunocompromised or what have you. And if the commission didn't allow us to waive that requirement, we'd be dead in the water. So uh, that's very much so appreciated. Yeah, that's very important. Um, so folks understand. Uh, so the commission took this uh, step last night of amending the cease and desist order for adult use operators. But there are also other ongoing discussions within the commission uh, right now uh, to figure out other ways within the commission's power to help out some of these applicants. And what Mike was talking about there was uh, cur applicants currently have to have everyone who's working for them go to a third party fingerprint vendor while the application process is happening. And the commissioners have proposed potentially allowing that to be delayed until final licensure to help avoid sending immunocompromised or other vulnerable people to these fingerprint companies. So thank you for bringing that up, Mike. And before we uh, transition on to some other questions, uh, Peter brought up a really interesting topic uh, just a few minutes ago, which was the distinction right now between the adult use market in Massachusetts and the medical market in Massachusetts is that medical operators must be what's called vertically integrated which is to say they must cultivate, manufacture, process, retail, deliver, all under the same roof, same company license, et cetera. Met, uh, adult use operators, like we've been talking about, micro businesses, cultivators, transporters, delivery companies, retail companies, are all different licenses. Now, the adult use companies can own more than one kind of license, but they don't have to, and they certainly don't have to own all of the licenses. Now, one of the proposals uh, that's been spearheaded uh, recently is a proposal to break up the medical licenses into cultivators, uh, processors, retailers, and then my proposal, which is delivery uh, companies. Uh, so, Peter, uh, you obviously think this is a very good idea to break up the medical licenses. Now, beyond just reducing barriers to entry for companies seeking to enter the medical arena, what other benefits do you see coming about as a result of making those smaller license types available for medical? The benefit is totally for the patient at the end of the day. And the reason I can say that is because an increase in these license types means an increase in variety of product availability. And there is not enough variety in product availability in the current market. We all know it. There are people out there looking for consistent medicine. And sometimes you go to a place, they have what you want for a little while, then they don't have it anymore. And that's frustrating. If we had more of these licenses up and running, supply would be better. For the industry, it's a good thing because, Muddy, I know you want to sell good wheat at the end of the day. I don't think you care whose shelf it ends up on as long as you can sell it. If that happens to be a medical shelf or an adult use shelf, you're getting paid the same money either way, right? Do you care who it's going to? No. I don't. But, I, I do, though. There's, there's well, some people that aren't going to get my wheat. <laughs> well, I understand, but I mean, I mean, you wouldn't have a problem selling to medical no. if that was what your license said, right? So think about this too. Muddy, Ed, Mike, you guys know better than anybody sitting here how hard it is to find property, right? How much fighting did you go through to scrap over the property that you got? And part of the reason you had to fight for it is because there are so many bans in the Commonwealth. You cannot ban medical. So if you're going for a medical cultivation, now you've sure. got the entire Commonwealth open up at your disposal for real estate. There's no more fighting over scraps over these tiny little zones. You can go and cultivate and manufacture or retail and do just that. I think that's a great point, Peter. Uh, you know, us personally, it took us a year, almost a year to find a property that we, one, was zoned properly, and two, we were in a town that we had confidence would give us a host community agreement. So it, that's a great point. It really is. What would be really nice is if we could get a medical endorsement with a micro business license, because as it stands right now with a micro business license, we can't cultivate medical, but it, even though we'd like to and sell it, 
if it could be a secondary license to allow us to expand canopy space or something, that'd be awesome. Otherwise, if we grow outside of our means and we're selling all the product we can, we have to relinquish the micro business just to be able to do more in the space where we are. So I think there's a couple of points there that may be something that, hey, if you're going to allow medical non-integrated, how, how could a micro business get there uh, in any sort of way? I also think the range of product um, offering, you know, changes when we can enter into the medical space, you know, as far as the milligram restrictions go for, uh, for edible products and whatnot. You know that's different. So it ought, you know, having that endorsement would allow us to uh, to have a much wider range of products available and being produced, which would be awesome for us. What's the more your... people that are, oh. no, please. I was going to say the more people that are allowed to grow, the more medicine that is available, the better the quality is. Competition is good for business, and that's good for patients. That's going to add to variety, and then that's also going to add to the price going down by and large. Um, which is something that we also need here in Massachusetts. There are so many pros to having a program like that, that, you know, it, it would be Massachusetts to get on that immediately. Without question. And it's so interesting to think about how the deverticalization of the medical market almost has a pre-made framework ready for it in the structure of the adult use market and the insight uh, Andrew like you're saying about allowing some of these craft cultivators micro businesses to operate kind of a parallel medical operation to me makes a lot of sense and one uh, thing that didn't uh, get brought up is it also incentivizes there to be an actual nonprofit medical group because um, as many of you know, all of the RMDs in Massachusetts back when medical first started had to be nonprofits. And right now only I think one or two still are those are nonprofits. So making these smaller licenses available is a great pathway to maybe bring in some nonprofits uh, who wanna grow high quality cannabis and provide it at a very low price. So um, excellent, excellent. Um, changing gears a little bit, uh, I have a question for Andrew, Mike and, and Ed in particular. Um, so we talked a little bit about what law, what the regulators are doing, the ideas they've been coming up with to, to help your businesses, whether in the queue or once you're open. Um, but what can state lawmakers do? Uh, for folks who are wondering, cannabis businesses are exempt from the federal stimulus package. So what can state lawmakers do to help your businesses right now uh, for going forward? Anyone? Well, I mean, there's um, always the idea of the state creating this state bank, um, a state bank that would allow this industry to get involved without charging maintenance fees in the thousands of dollars per month. Um, if such an institution were to exist, I would say that they'd be able to offer loans to businesses like us when we're suffering. Um, the other thing that they could do is they could bring awareness that um, while we are not offered the ability to tap into this uh, bailout per se, we're still having to pay taxes at the end of the day. So which is it? Are, do you want our tax money going, you know, or do you not want it? Um, make a decision. We're either in or we're out. It's hard to pay tax money if you can't be operable. So, you know, the bottom line is they need to do everything they can to make sure that um, adult use is as operational as medical use. Because, you know, if you're going to sit there and you're going to feed people booze all day, well, why can't why can't they go out and get their medicine that really cures them? Yeah, you know, I think um, another you know point there, you know, to the to Andrew's point, um, you know, there is a way that we can open recreational dispensaries and just not allow out of state IDs. That's the concern. That's why they're closed. They think, you know, Baker made a statement saying that um, essentially they're closing the dispensaries because. Uh, they're concerned that we're one of the only recreational in the region and it's going to bring people from New York, it's going to bring people from Rhode Island, Connecticut, etc. So just, I mean, he, the governor had the power to shut down half the industry a couple of months ago with the vape crisis. I'm sure he has the power to say only Massachusetts residents right now. 
that would be a huge the governor help. the governor is getting pressure from people in the legislature i've been in touch with folks at dave rogers office and i know that uh, the joint committee on cannabis policy has been pushing that there's no reason that adult use retail can't be doing appointment only curbside pickup just like the medical program is doing there's no reason whatsoever and it would be a huge savings because like ed said the banks aren't going to help the cannabis industry the tax man is not going to help the only thing the tax man wants to see from you is a check he's not trying to write you one so they need to do something and this would be a way to do it at least keep things open and moving forward and not getting killed off a absolutely and unfortunately as sad uh, as it may be it seems like the governor's pretty intent on pushing back however i think one of the good insights that that we be covered earlier in the discussion is that the adult use market in the eyes of the governor is more than just retail sales so while he may continue this hostility to retail sales the fact that pathways are starting to open up to get seeds in the ground whether it's under the auspices of growing for transfer to a medical facility or whether it's under the auspices of growing for transfer to a adult use facility once they're back open because that i think ed was talking a little bit earlier about how for those who understand the agricultural side of this industry a disruption in the supply chain isn't like a factory shutting down it's almost resetting the entire industry due to the nature of how seeds have to get in the ground grow be processed etc so i really hope uh, that the uh, consortium of voices who are working on this project of, of getting the governor to understand the importance of the adult use supply chain will continue to work with him um any other comments on, on the situation with the governor uh, before we move forward uh, ellen I know well, I, oh sorry mike go ahead grant i was i was just going to add really quickly to what you were saying there and you know it's true you know, if, you know, even give these companies the opportunity to just continue their internal operations with a skeleton crew so that the supply can build up. Everybody knows that Massachusetts had a huge supply issue and that's why price, the prices were through the roof. So if we want to, you know, make this a more affordable product, let's allow the industry to catch up a little bit. I mean, it's an opportunity. It really is. And to get an idea, um, I don't know what the rest of you have heard lately on a wholesale legitimate pound in the Massachusetts market. The last number I heard was $5,000 for a pound on the legit market. <laughs> More? Has that gone up, oh, yeah. Ed, really? I've never heard that. Oh, my there's, God. Yeah, Are you kidding me? There's somebody who's in business right now who made a sale for 52 Come on. I think that's where growers need to step up, especially those that have been growing for a while and talking about the 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 market and the powers that be gouging the recreational market and those consumers. Because as we know, it doesn't cost you that much money to create a pound if you're doing it right. So what are your what are your growers getting per freaking four by four like space? Are they not getting like a pound of light? What is going on here that you need to charge these astronomical prices to make back your money or are you just making such an egregious profit margin off of this market there, there, there's something that's got to go and also it's not it's it's something that massachusetts has to confront that we don't have our recreational stores open and we advocated to tax and regulate like alcohol if alcohol stores are open and operational no question recreational cannabis stores should be open that is how it should be we need to break the stigma they need to be seen as equals um, I think Charlie Baker is doing a disservice and I can post the link or we can post the link, but there is a petition that is going around that's getting traction that, you know, is um, really going to probably be what helps to overturn this. So if you haven't already, write to Charlie Baker and let him know, be professional, be polite, but also be concise that this needs to change immediately. Hey, Ellen, the only thing I want to say to this is as a cultivator, um, I can't sell for anything less than market price because at the end of the mile, the store is still going to charge 15 to $20 a gram. So if I were to charge 5,000 or 3,000, they're still going to charge you 15 to $20 a gram. Um, the difference is, is with businesses like ours, 
Um, I'm taking my money and reinvesting into people that deserve to be on the legal market too. So um, where, you know, some of the other places like Andrew said, probably will never touch my flower. Um, they have other motives in mind. Um, Ed, you know, it brings me back to a point that you raised some months ago um, uh, that I it always stuck with me, which was as a cultivator, you wanted to be able to set aside some of your product for sale in kind of like the nonprofit operation that I was talking a little bit about earlier. And I think that's a really important insight, which is that if the entire supply chain thinks about ways to provide product for in particular vulnerable people uh, fiscally or otherwise, it helps to, to take out some of that cutthroat uh, charge as much as possible at the end of the line mentality. So I've always liked that idea. I hope it will come more to fruition. And I always want to, I just want to thank you because you brought that up from, to me for the first time and I've run with it and I'm going to hopefully be able to do something with it. So thank you. I, I just look at, I mean, if we have the ability to feed our families, pay our employees, why can't we take a little bit aside and give back to people who are making our lives comfortable? Uh, the, and especially the people that can't afford it, the veterans, the, the single moms, the people living on the poverty line. Uh, I mean, it doesn't take much. If I'm selling, you know, 2,000 pounds a year, I can't take one pound and have it donated every couple of months, whatever, for people in need. You know, it's just, it's just, it, it, it's, it's like Elmo says, kick it down. And, you know, I think that's a really good opportunity that you bring up uh, Elmo. Um, I just want to take a minute. I know we've been having a really good discussion, but a lot of folks in the cannabis community have experienced some loss over the past couple of years. Um, in particular, uh, very recently, uh, someone who was very involved in mass can panels through the Ed Village uh, over the years. Um, he went by Elmo to a lot of us, unfortunately passed away. And so just taking a moment to, to realize that sometimes the cannabis industry can seem very amorphous it either seems like these big corporate players or, you know, these, these organizations. And, it, and sometimes the personal side of things fall by the wayside. But for those who aren't as intimately involved with the uh, local community as, as some of us, it's really the human connection that makes everything about this industry, especially in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, so special. And Elmo was someone who knew what it meant to be an authentic human being. And he inspired me to get more involved, not only with MassCan, but with, with so many different projects and, and organizations. So uh, Elmo sadly did pass away recently. And, and I'm just glad that his name was brought up because I, I wanted to take the opportunity to, to honor him a little bit. And uh, if anyone else wants to say anything while we have a minute to kind of decompress, please feel free. I think, you know, Kyle Correo, Elmo, was a wonderful human being, and he gave a lot to our community. He was one of the best hash makers in the country. He was a very active and outspoken veteran. And I think that the way he conducted himself and the authenticity and integrity of what he did is a legacy that we need to continue to carry on. And by, by kicking it down, by mentioning his name, by doing what we need to do to honor the memory of somebody who helped to pioneer this industry. He was advocating before there was a recreational. He was there always for patients, even before there was a medical program. So doing what's right, kicking down and being mindful and giving back. I think those are really important things. And I'm, I'm glad that Mascan's here to have that platform. And I'm really glad we're taking this time to you know, make mention of Kyle and all the wonderful things he did. And he's going to continue to inspire through all of us. Alan, you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, he marched with Mickey, you know? Yeah. It, it's such a important thing to do. Um, those of you, you know, who maybe are just learning about cannabis activism or, or those of you who have, who have been in the community for a while, you know, it, it's not just policy and, and business. It's, it's, it's human beings and, 
and you get to know these folks and they, they become your friends and, and loss, especially of someone who is an inspiring and, and passionate, authentic leader in the community is, is always hard. But it's also important to remember that the way people live on, like Ellen was saying, is by upholding the virtues and the morals that they lived by and, and mentioning their name and continuing to uphold that legacy. So thank you to MassCan and thank you all for letting me take this little digression uh, to talk about Kyle. I think he's always going to be Elmo in my head, but so uh, th thank you all, and, and sorry for that little bit of a break there, but we, we're going to keep going on this stream. Uh, just nice to take a second to reflect now and again. So, All right, a um, little bit of a transition, but on that same front, uh, Ellen, what virus has what effects has the virus uh, and the pandemic that's going on right now had on access to cannabis for veterans and are you or anyone in your circle working on any projects right now uh, to help uh, the, that community thanks for asking um yes so right now um it's a devastating thing for the veteran community it's hard because a lot of veterans in the state of massachusetts need to remember that there's a mandatory registration and that deters a lot of people for a number of reasons but it also deters the veteran populace so veterans don't want to be on a mandatory registration and right now they can't access cannabis through the retail shop so that puts a lot of veterans without their medicine and also their um there's a lack of community that happens when we're all isolated like this. You know, we have to be stay at home, everything. But I think right now, one of the most important things you can do is check on a vet, call a veteran, tell them you love them. Even just a text. It doesn't have to be, hey, you know, I just want to make sure things aren't hard. But like, hey, how's your day going? How are you doing? Just just checking in is really, really going to be important. Um, right now, there are some food drives happening in the state of Massachusetts. And uh, what I think is important to make mention of is that it's not the federal government that's stepping in, it's the state. The Massachusetts Military Support Foundation is giving away free meals to veterans. They've been doing it at Gillette Stadium. They're doing it at Sandwich High School on Cape Cod. So even though they're not directly in the cannabis community, they're helping the veteran population. And it's, it's, as long as you're helping veterans. So if you are a veteran and if you're in need, um, make sure that you look up the Massachusetts Military Support Foundation. Um, they can give you a box full of provisions for food for two weeks. So that way you can stay in and not have to worry about going out. Um, for veteran organizations that I've seen um, stepping up specifically as it relates to COVID, um, I've just seen all the veteran organizations letting people know that, you know, if you're here that we have support. Um, but I have seen some veterans in the community that are that are stepping it up, specifically here in New England, like Devin Tillier of Name Brand Kitchen. He's uh, volunteering at Soup Kitchens. Uh, Mike Goodenough from Sweet Heal, his company went and they donated hand sanitizers to St. Francis' Hospital. Steve Mandilli, did anybody see him yesterday? He's such an outspoken, wonderful activist. He was at the State House advocating for recreational use, specifically for veterans. So I think um, any of the veterans that are doing things just to support them, reach out to a veteran. Uh, for myself, once my education comes online, our classes are free for veterans. So in the next, hopefully two to three weeks, I'll have that platform up and running. So that way it'll give veterans something to, to do, stay educated, stay productive. So, um, you know, if you know a veteran, please reach out to a veteran. Oh, Ellen, thank you so much. You covered so many important topics. Um, you mentioned Stephen Mandeli, and instantly uh, the bill that he's been working on came up in my mind, uh, uh, which is a bill related to veterans' access to medical cannabis. Now, there's been some debate and discussion, and it, it's actually being sent for further study uh, right now in the Massachusetts legislature. But can you tell us a little bit about the challenges veterans face getting access to their cannabis, be it medical or now adult use? Yes, and I'm actually, I'm so glad you brought that up. I'd written it down. It's bill uh, 4274 is the bill. And what this would do is it would open up a pathway uh, for veterans to gain safe access where veterans that are disabled, they would be able to send in their disability letter to the state and they don't have to go to a physician. You already have your disability letter with the um, VA. So that would be enough and that would streamline the process for them. Um, and what that's able to do is the more veterans that we can get for access, the better. Um, and then um, Steve Mandilli does a lot of great work. And with bills like this, it's, 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 you know, I didn't know that it got sent back for review. I hadn't heard that just yet, but it, it is hard because veterans getting access to 
cannabis, they have to break through one, you know, a stigma that they might already have, not knowing that, you know, you can you can serve your country and you can also be a cannabis user. And that doesn't take away from your service or your integrity or anything. You know, you don't go from being somebody that served your country to being a drug user or any any you know, words that aren't positive that are associated with cannabis use that might have been put in there by like, you know, the D.A.R.E. program or stigma or whatever it might be. So breaking down that stigma, letting veterans know that there um, is cannabis as an alternative to opiates. As you know, the statistic 22 too many, we're losing 22 veterans a day to being overprescribed. I can go to the VA and they'll send me pills to my house, but they won't prescribe cannabis. They won't talk about it at the VA. So this is why we need these veteran advocacy groups to um, advocate for education. This is why I'm such a huge advocate for veteran education specifically because there's such a lack for our demographic and for these veterans that have gone and served their country. And now they come home and in some states they don't have cannabis available to them. Medical marijuana isn't everywhere in the United States. And we are so, you know, we, we or I do, I gripe about the program because I want it to be better. We can always be better, but we have to take a moment and reflect and be thankful for what we have and look at it and be like, all right, Massachusetts has a functioning medical and a functioning recreational program. How do we get that in other states like Alabama, states that don't have one at all? And how do we get access to those patients, those consumers, those veterans, those people in need that are going to need it? So I think here in Massachusetts, one of the um, biggest barriers to entry for the veterans, I think, would be that mandatory registration. Um, another thing is there are not a lot of doctor's offices doing those free days for veterans anymore. Can of care stops. Um, I know that um, Wellness Alternative is going to start doing them in the next couple months. But, um, and also veterans not being able to get out of their homes to the doctor's offices. With COVID, um, now doctor's offices can do these virtual telecommunications. And that's really important. Some veterans are homebound or unable to leave or maybe don't want to go into a doctor's office. So um, there with this virus and with people realizing that not everybody can leave their home and we need better, safer, quicker, immediate access, this is also helping our veteran population. So whatever we can do to help our patients is simultaneously helping our, our veteran population. You, you raised such so many important points yet again. I, I feel like almost everything you say I want to write down and, and look more uh, into later because you just cover so many important issues. But one in particular that you mentioned there was telehealth for uh, certifications for medical cards. And the reason I want to expand on this a little bit is this is crucial for folks who may be interested in getting their medical card. Uh, previously in Massachusetts until about last week, two weeks ago, uh, to get a medical cannabis card, you had to go into the doctor if you were a new patient for the most part. And now those doctors and nurses who are able to give cannabis certifications can all certify people over the phone. And as a result, the prices have gone down down dramatically for certification and for people who might be on a, a fixed income or otherwise that is that's really important and uh, one thing is that unfortunately it's only temporary so if you are looking to get your medical card and you want it via telehealth I uh, encourage folks to get that as soon as they can um, before I ask uh, Peter a question about uh, his group mass sense uh, did anyone else have anything they wanted to weigh in on about the veterans all right, Peter. Um, so you work with a, a nonprofit um, called Mass Sense. Um, what have you guys been doing uh, recently to reach out to lawmakers as they've been responding, like you were talking about earlier, to the actions of Governor Baker and developments in the cannabis industry, particularly the supply chain in the context of this uh, pandemic? Well, we've been in contact with people on the Joint Committee for Cannabis Policy, and we've been in contact with people at the Cannabis Control Commission. Um, we were pushing for the same kind of things that we're starting to see now, where uh, with the updated cease and desist that adult use will be able to feed into the medical chain. That's really been the focus of our attention since the pandemic came out, because we knew that patient numbers were going to go up, and they have significantly. It's a serious strain on uh, the supply chain, and it needs some relief. And it's, I'm glad that the commission was able to do something before uh, we had to wait on the governor to act. Wonderful. It sounds like, uh, like we were talking about earlier, a lot of the work that you were doing isn't just 
uh, proposal anymore, you've actually been impacting some of these changes that have been happening quite rapidly. So a lot of credit to uh, to you and, and the other folks working on these issues, Peter. You've been you've been helping a lot of people. So. Um, Thanks. So uh, now a more general question. I've uh, really been enjoying the conversation so far. Uh, so we've actually had a substantial number of people joining us to watch. So thank you all again. Um, this question is kind of a specific question about some news that's been happening over the past week. And it's in particular directed to those of you who own businesses. But please, anyone feel free to weigh in. Um, so over the past week or so, uh, there's been uh, some coverage in the Boston Globe about employees in the cannabis industry who have raised concerns about their safety while uh, these, some of these businesses, in particular medical uh, operations, continue to operate during the pandemic as an essential business. Um, those concerns actually led the Cannabis Control Commission, while it was putting out its amended um, cease and desist order last night that we got into detail on, to mention that any employee who feels unsafe or who feels they were designated as essential when they were non-essential can send an email to commission at cccmass.com with the subject line COVID-19 agent complaint. Uh, to, to reach out about these issues. So they're taking it seriously. And one commissioner, Commissioner Shaleen Title, actually gave out her personal phone number and encouraged folks to reach out to her directly. Um, so the question is this. Um, based on these concerns being raised by industry employees, based on some positive tests we've seen at some of these companies, as business owners, what have you been doing to adapt your workplace safety protocols in light of these changes that we're seeing in this new paradigm that we all find ourselves in? Um, I, I, I'll jump in first here. So, you know, I think that first of all, as smaller operators, we inherently are are socially distancing you know when we're when we're going to be operating right you know I, I mentioned earlier that you know 10 people are part of my company right now our building is 15,000 square feet so think about how close anybody is ever going to be you know i have uh you know people that are work some friends of mine that work over at netta um and they've specifically mentioned the way the policies and have been implemented but you know we see that we saw the spike of you know a couple people testing positive and i think that has something to do with the fact that you know they have how many employees at any given time in their building 30 40 50 60 you know so that's a big difference uh, but i think that going forward we all have to um not necessarily be six feet away from each other forever but going through this just kind of uh, it puts it puts these kind of things right in the top of your head, and you can be more mindful when you are um, working on uh, standard operating procedures, employee you know standards, and stuff like that. Um, so, if anything, I just think it's helping us be more mindful. Mr. Yeah, as small. Yeah, as, as a small operator, like like Mike said, we're we're gonna be social distancing ourselves anyways. But if you really want to get into it and you want to look at how you can do some standard operating procedures updates then sure yeah like you know we have uh, hair nets and and beard masks and you know you can always add on to it you know in times of need when potential outbreaks are around that you know there's more cleaning uh everybody asks you know you're, oh you're in the adult use but yeah we're, we're regulated a lot like the medical uses so when the people come in to inspect our facility, they're going to be inspecting it just like they're expecting uh, inspecting a medical facility. So sanitation is is 100% top of priority, like how you clean your space, how you keep your employees um, safe, and, and how you keep them protected from outside conditions. Uh, how we build most of our spaces, they're all we've got clean rooms to come in and change into different gear. So these types of things just kind of get up the ante just a little bit, maybe different uh, processes, different uh, chemicals, bleaching agents or uh, antibacterial stations, such. These are things that, you know, they're going to want to see as we move forward. And it's just minor adjustments, in my opinion. Um, it, they're, they're minor in terms of how much you got to move, but they're major in terms of policies and procedures. So um, I think it's important, you know, it's going to go all the way down. You know, having a safe work environment is going to put safe medicine out there for people. So 
focus in on those few things, I think is going to be important. Let's be realistic here. Um, these operations that have been growing the McWeed haven't had the best reputation for taking care of their employees to begin with. Uh, if you do some digging, there are some articles out there on the conditions that these employees have had to endure. And there are actually lawsuits out there right now with some of these prior employees. So uh, the COVID-19 isn't the, uh, it's just the tip of the iceberg for a lot of these places. And it comes back down to craft business. Uh, if you look at our businesses here, and I'm sure um, that Andrews and, um, and Daryl's uh, processes are pretty similar to mine where um, you're not worried about the ingredients you're feeding the plant. Um, so you're not worried about the dangers to your employees because there's not much there. It's, it's awesome to see that you all seem to not only have, have thought about this, but recognize that it's, it's partly down to the companies involved in the industry to be leaders in this sense and not necessarily wait to be told how to keep their employees safe, but to make that the ethos of what they're doing day to day operationally. Um, one interesting thing is that we kind of have some live interaction going on. Some folks have been leaving us uh, some questions and such and some comments. Uh, so if you do want to leave a comment or question in the comments section on the live stream, uh, try to and we'll try to read them. Uh, one of the comments we got uh, is from uh, a gentleman by the name of Big Ed. And he said, uh, he said that uh, how, he, he asked how long is it going to take for an average uh, small company to recover the money they spent applying, if anyone wants to take that. Well, uh, you know, you figure that, <clears throat> excuse me, you figure that you have, you know, for us, we're going, we're going to be pretty much at two years of paying rent um, by the time we're operating. Um, so, you know, we talk about the high wholesale price and, you know, Ed mentioned, you know, really having to sell at market value because otherwise the retailers are just going to be making all the profit. Right. So the name of the game is getting going. So once you're operating and you're, you know, you're, you have plants in the ground and you have products going out the door and you're building that brand recognition, it's going to pay itself back over time. And it's not going to take that long because yes, in, you know, looking at the cost that you put in, you know, from, you know, like I was a former teacher, like that's a lot of money, but looking at the profit margin that can come in, it's going to recoup itself. It's just, you got to get to the, you got to get to the, uh, uh, to the, the last the other table. Yeah. Uh, anyone else want to, want to weigh in on that? Uh, we can move on if, uh, Unless Andrew uh, we, we had a we had a timetable of somewhere between 12 to 15 months and that's making sure everything goes right you know and that's that's recouping everything from construction to first year operational costs and then everything prior to that to get to this point where we are now and, and it's all it's all relevant you know what is the price per pound going to be when my little shop actually gets up and running, you know, that varies, that extends the timeline or decreases the timeline. So there's a lot of variables that are out of our control. You know, we're going to get COVID 20 and 21 that we're going to have to deal with and how to drive that cuts. So, you know, it's, it's hard to say, but you know, you can give it a rough number, you know, and that's for me, when we did the numbers, it was right around there. Gotcha. Uh, Peter or Ellen, anything you'd like to weigh in on, on this one? Um, I feel I feel bad for the brick and mortar locations that opened um, and then immediately had to shut their doors. I think a pure oasis, they were the first yeah. equity applicants. They opened and literally had to shut their doors two weeks later. Um, and it's yeah. hard because you know how That's much money that took just to get to where they're at, to do all the things. So um, I think when doors open again, and especially because pure oasis in particular, they have, um, you know, a great team not to, you know, to include their owners, but like specifically when I'm thinking of, you know, people that have put in, in our industry, our local industry, Mike Whitaker, Justin Lopes, Eve Marie, um, four daughters um, for a different dispensary, like dispensaries that have been in the queue waiting for years, finally get to open their doors and then get shut down for this. 
Um, so making sure that they have ways to um, still be operational, still offer curbside, still be able to employ their employees that have taken on these jobs and taken on these industry positions. So um, I think that having better contingency plans in place is going to be paramount for the success of um, these businesses and for the success of this industry. We can't just shut down recreational shops um, for, um, for weeks on end and not germinate any seeds or things like that. So it, it is important that we have what is essential personnel? Um, how much cannabis can they still cultivate? Can they still do curbside even if they are recreational? Making sure that we have ID checks, making sure that protocols and SOPs are in place for these exact contingencies, because I bet the um, Cannabis Control Commission didn't have protocols for what do you do in case of quarantine? What do you do specifically for COVID? What do you do when you have to be six feet apart and you still have to do things like transaction sales? So these are things that are going to shape not only the world, but shape our industry. And I think it's so important for Massachusetts to be proactive instead of, you know, right now I feel like we're dragging our feet and these businesses like Kira Oasis, Four Daughters, other, you know, things, Deep Roots, how are they going, how are they going to survive? So um, just keeping our industry in mind and when those doors are able to open again, remember those dispensaries that took care of their employees and the ones that didn't because this is an industry that's based on supply and demand. So take care of those who take care of you and those whistleblowers in the dispensaries, good job, because it's not just you, they know it's not just the employees, it's the consumers and it's the patients that are going to suffer if they're exposed and then they're you know, exposing those that already have compromised immune systems. So I applaud those that spoke up and I think that we're going to see some industry-wide changes and I would want Massachusetts to be on the forefront of that and hopefully Charlie Baker will get on board. Absolutely. Uh, Peter, anything you'd like to weigh in on with this one? Nothing's popping to mind right now, Grant, honestly. Not not a worry. I just didn't want to take a chance away from anyone to weigh in. So. Um, all right. Well, with that said, let's move to uh, the question I kind of had for the end. We went the full hour. It felt like five minutes. So that was a great conversation. Um, so to all the panelists, you know, feel free to answer it in whatever order you guys want. Um, what's one accomplishment uh, you want to share with folks uh, over the last year, be it personal, business, or otherwise? And while doing that, if there's any social media you want to share or information for where folks can reach out to you or follow you, please uh, let us know. I guess I'll start. Um, done a lot of things over the past year, but my favorite thing was working to get the definition for mother plant worked into the definitions. And you might say, big deal. If you are an outdoor cultivator, it's a big deal because the way the regulations are written, only immature plants can use supplemental lighting in an outdoor cultivation situation. Uh, before this definition came into play, that meant that an outdoor cultivator was not allowed to propagate his own clones unless he could maintain those mothers only when the sunlight would allow him to. So if you wanted to plant in the spring for your outdoors, you had to either pop from seed or buy clones from someone else. We decided this was unreasonable and impractical and asked very politely for the definition of mother plant to work around that. And we were happy to get it. Uh, it was really a simple ask. It really was. It was that easy. As they just asked for it. But I think maybe that's why it was my favorite thing. It was important and it was easy. You know, it's interesting, Peter, because it's an important lesson for folks who might just be getting into cannabis activism. It really does sometimes come down to just writing out an idea and asking the right person. Yeah, yeah it is. Uh yeah, it was right about this time last year when I sat in front of the commission and I said, this is, this is the first time you've actually seen my uh, business application number. And we brought Barney Frank in and, you know, we really kind of pushed this idea of how is a micro business going to be able to survive within a market when prices drop and you get to a certain point. And one of the things that we really wanted to uncover was having the uh, delivery endorsement added. Uh, delivery endorsement was a term that they came up with, but uh, we advocated hard for having an ability to be able to sell our cannabis without having to go through the loophole of a middleman, which would be like the wholesale market. So 
uh, owning a micro business and being able to sell locally direct to consumers helps us a lot on that bottom line. So and these fights and Peter knows, you know, you, you put them in front of people and they kind of laugh and you think it's going to go away, but the more you advocate for it, the more you push to have those things included in the regulations, the better of a chance you have. So now that micro businesses has that, uh, we're really happy to say that, you know, the advocating we've done has helped push that to that point. So it's not just us, it's a lot of us around our, our group and people around. So, you know, that, you know, it seemed like it was written, like it was going to go our way and then they seemed to take it away and, but then it seemed to come back in. So having that really helps our business. That micro business uh, delivery endorsement program really was such a important addition, not just for you folks who are applying now, but for everyone in the future who applies for a micro business, you really supersized the effectiveness of what that license can be. So kudos to everyone involved with that. Um, Ed, Mike, or Ellen? Um, I, I'm happy to jump in, you know, uh, also on the, you know, the activism side of it, you know, I'm definitely a newbie to it over, you know, throughout this process. Um, Ed, you've helped tremendously in rallying people. And I'm really, I'm really, really proud of what we were able to accomplish as a, as a collective in getting uh, micro business added to that priority list, because otherwise the three of us would probably still be sitting in the queue, not even having an RF, uh, a request for information yet. So that really is, I don't want to take credit for it because Ed, you really, you were uh, instrumental in, in team getting effort, in. my friend. Team effort. Yeah, so that's what I'm very proud of. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, Eleanor, Ed. Um, I would think both this year. Um, an accomplishment that I'm really proud of is um, working with more veteran groups, talking, getting more uh, cohesiveness across the industry. Working with specifically the 22 too many in Seattle, Washington. Um, and talking to them about they're starting a clone program where they're giving away clones to veterans. So to combat that 22 a day, they're giving uh, clones to veterans. So once the weather gets nice, um, I'm looking forward to seeing that implemented here in New England and seeing um, more veterans getting access to cannabis and more um, patients in general. Anybody that needs the plan needs to be able to get the plan. And I'm so thankful for um, this platform and for all of you and the work that you've done. And we're all going to um, continue to do and how we're all going to continue to kick down to those in need. So true. Uh, Mr. D'Souza, would you like to round us off? Yeah, I just want to say that um, every accomplishment that we put forward is going to make it easier for those to come after us. And in order to make sure that this industry survives and doesn't get swept under the rug and then, you know, re illegalized, um, you know, we got to keep up our efforts and make sure that more people can come into the industry. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's always nice to hear from people when they say, oh, well, thank you for this. Thank you for that. But people got to look in the mirror too and realize that they're as big of a part of the movement that, you know, that we are, uh, because it takes, yeah, it's, it's one thing to get on stage with a megaphone or microphone. It's another thing to be in that audience. Sometimes people are afraid to be seen in that audience. So, um, I'm, I'm happy that more and more people are coming out. Um, last thing I want to say, uh, look for a post uh, later on today. I'm going to go live with a big surprise from River Run that uh, I think is going to blow a lot of people's minds. So, uh, you know, congratulations to Muddy. I can't wait to see the look on your faces tomorrow. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for being on this panel. Thank you, Ed. And uh, just to make sure so folks can check out your Facebook later today for a big announcement. Absolutely. I'm going to have a special guest with me. Well, that's wonderful. I'm very excited to see that. I always enjoy your live videos just because, well, you know, it's you. Um, so thank you all to the panelists. Thank you to everyone who listened uh, to our first in a series of Education Village panels as they transition into the virtual world. 
For those of you who know the history of the Education Village, we actually have the person who hosted the first ever panel with us on this panel, that being Ellen. So um, it really is being part of history to have hosted this first, first virtual panel today. And it humbles me that I was able to do so alongside folks like yourself who really in my eyes are, are titans of the industry in the Commonwealth and probably nationally uh, when we get there. So I can't thank you all enough for being with me today. I can't thank MassCan enough for the opportunity and the platform to host this virtual panel. For those of you who do follow MassCan, please continue to keep an eye on the Facebook and Instagram pages. Future, future virtual panels will have different hosts. Uh, Ellen, for example, is going to be hosting one at some point. Uh, some other folks who are really great will be hosting as well. And uh, those announcements will continue to be made through all the MassCan channels. So again, to all the board of directors of MassCan, to everyone involved with the Education Village, and to all of our panelists and viewers, thank you for being with us today. And I hope you all continue to make the most out of your opportunity to turn this experience into a chance to improve your knowledge, your lives, or otherwise. So signing off from MassCan, from Grant Smith Ellis, from all the panelists, Enjoy the rest of your afternoons, and we hope to see you again soon. Be well, everyone. Peace. Peace.